I'm uh, Michael Blackman. I'm with Atwell. I'm over our AUD configuration team. Um, I've been in uh, utility design. Uh, primarily, it was transmission design uh, for about 15 years using AutoCAD, Civil 3D, Map 3D. Uh, transitioned into a GIS analyst role for several years and then went to a, a development, uh, like full stack development position at one of the engineering firms I worked for, uh, and then transitioned to uh, more of an architect uh, slash leading the development team. And I came to Atwell about two years ago to help lead our group um, and build and, and uh, work with, with you all. So um, I've got a little bit of experience in, in everything and we're building a team that uh, right now is, uh, we feel confident in like, handling just about any solution that we need built, so. Uh, you guys already heard from me, but I worked for Trico for many years and it been in the industry for, you know, about 16 years. And so now I'm jumped on with that. Well, um, Jesse beat me into submission. So we ended up coming over, but, uh, I, I help oversee that, that side of it. And my experience with being an administrator or being thrown into an administrator position, we, uh, it's, I guess this post live support side, uh, I, I'm only going to speak from my experience. I did try to do my due diligence. I reached out to Scott and Kyle and Brandon, people that I know that have been in my position where you've been the uh, the in-house you know support on that side. And I wanted to kind of convey that to uh, to others if you guys haven't been there or if you're just venturing off and uh, understand kind of what that role looks like because I know that like once I started getting into it, the I'm not going to call it my resume, but the requirements list just started growing. Uh, for what's needed in order to actually maintain and take this uh, product on and make it successful uh, for the best best case. But anyway, uh, we'll jump right into it. I know we want to get on to that as-built side, so um, we'll uh, try to rush through this. Uh, again, from my, my experience, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with Pioneers, but whenever they originally started pioneering, this was, my, uh, this was what I felt like uh, my path was for AUD is they gave me AUD and they said, go that direction and try to make it better. You don't know what you're going to be up against. You don't know what the hurdles are like, the weather is like, how long it's going to be, and really where your end, your end point's going to be. And so for me, that was uh, that was kind of like my introduction. I had, had no path, but I, these people, at least they knew they were going west and that's about all they had. And so felt like it was relatable. Uh, the admin role, uh, I've seen women involved with it and men. So I felt like the, as far as like superheroes are concerned, like this is applicable. Uh, and whenever I think of AUD, AUD admins, uh, all the things I could think of were you had to be like an IT whisper or pseudo IT person, engineering bridge builder, because sometimes engineering doesn't play well with operations. I don't actually know of any cases where they are great. Um, those relationships are really great. Everyone's great on at face value, but um, when you really get in the weeds, everyone's got their opinion on how they want to how they want to do that. Uh, accounting angel, like you have to play nice with everybody in the sandbox. There, I feel like you have to have some sort of coding expertise to a certain extent, and I feel like design experience, which is my background, so I'm more passionate about that. I feel like that there is a need for design experience, and you have to be an internal public relations expert as well. Um, or at least have someone on your team that is uh, GIS knowledge, CAD experience, or a CAD expert to a certain extent, and a trainer and integrator as well. Uh, I felt like as you as you did this kind of uh, you you did, what was your guys' name just presented? Okay, you guys kind of I felt like kind of took it on. Perfect, like the, uh, what I'm seeing on your guys' approach. Fantastic. You guys are taking from lessons learned and really kind of maximizing that. Uh, so kudos to you. So on the front end, understanding the cost. For me, understanding the cost at first, it sounded like it was really expensive. Uh, it doesn't, it's actually really not so bad when you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it. It's really not terrible for what you, for what you get out of it. And as far as uh, understanding those costs, I feel like there's little cross, cost up front. And then you have to, have to factor in the cost after the fact. Um, because the people that ha that you have involved are usually kind of some of your go-to people, right? Um, so as far as understanding, let's see. The big thing, another big thing is, is understanding the why. And you have to keep that as a reminder on the forefront of why you're doing what you're doing. 
to kind of push through some of those hurdles. Understanding your stakeholders and how many people are involved. Design. I know linemen think that they can build the world over and over again without any type of design or engineering. But as soon as something goes wrong, it's engineering's fault. You know, the, the vicious cycle that we all uh, exist in, in that space. And understanding those variables are awesome. Uh, there's so many. Uh, tribal knowledge or legacy knowledge. Uh, that was a little tidbit from, from Scott. Understanding what you think is gospel and what's actually going to be in your end product for um, for any of these rules that have to be implemented in order to actually make a design function. Uh, CAD standards, where I came from, again, we had many hats that we were wearing. We had no CAD standards, still really have no CAD standards other than what was built into AUD. Um, so had to kind of more or less create those from the ground up. Uh, you can inform IT of your project, maybe, if uh, I know Scott didn't, Trico didn't, <laughs> Scott and Jason, uh, they uh, they included them later, and there was always kind of that ongoing joke as they presented over the years. Um, a little bit of co coding, uh, coding knowledge would be helpful, GIS mapping, team building, subject matter experts, and as far as subject matter experts are concerned, I would have to say... Uh, let's see. I think generally that companies cultivate these uh, from the design teams just because they know what they want for an end product. And usually, in most cases, you're getting the best and the brightest of each of those design departments, and that's what you kind of cling to. Um, Trico was limited on options, right? So they just got stuck with me. So... Uh, and that's, I guess it's okay. You know, you got to work with what you've got. Uh, so sometimes you have a limited selection and, uh, okay, IT, getting IT involved, it can help you and hurt you. Same thing with operations, same thing with design standards, all those things, they can help you and hurt you all in the same. Uh, one of the things I reached out and asked, uh, Scott gave me some feedback was about building a team. And he said, in my opinion, you need three characteristics of your team members. And this is, uh, this is an order to, an order of priority as he sees it, is one that someone that respects their peers, two, someone that knows the existing business process and tools, and three, someone that has a passion for doing things better tomorrow than they did today. Um, and I can I can echo that same same thing, uh, and I agree with that. Uh, Brandon, uh, we talked about a little bit of what's involved, kind of again back to like the resume of the person that's involved here, and. Brandon said, you know, you need IT involvement. Uh, SAP was his an example for him. And someone that can help troubleshoot your EAM issues that will potentially come up and creep up. Same thing, IT G GIS involvement as well. Uh, a CAD administrator and, or an AUD lead or a SME. AUD and AutoCAD experience, including licensing, uh, control point support, uh, design leads, construction standard leads, GIS leads, downstream leads. Uh, the list kind of goes on for what, for what you're needing there. Uh, what I would consider kind of like the configuration side of things is you got to understand multi-speak players. For, from my standpoint, was understanding how you could get in and dive in and understand from our, for, for my experience was NISC. We had no liaison between those, but that was my fault for not getting IT involved. IT had a literally direct phone contact, you know, kind of like the whole nuke thing. Like, you got to solve a problem, they could pick up the phone and get I was waiting on useless waste of time tickets that just fell out into outer space. And that was a waste of time on my part, but that's like a lesson learned. Uh, basic understanding of, of SQL, uh, that was super helpful. Cleary was the one that helped me with that. Uh, kind of dive into that. He was really questioning whether or not I needed to have access, but since I was kind of that IT person with administrative rights for installing, managing licenses, both AUD and AutoCAD, it was, it was all hats. Um, so I got to deal with a lot of that. Uh, one of the other things is we've, I think everybody's like the share points and things like that is bug fixes and tracking, whether it's enhancements, uh, you know, CAD macros, if you're 
wanting to not mess with things, customize things too much, but blocks and models. I didn't really know a whole lot about blocks, but I kind of dove in and YouTube was my best friend. And then I occasionally called Jason uh, to kind of help me out with some of that stuff and understand it a lot better. Uh, understanding validations, trying not to get tunnel vision or scope creep. Uh, those things are, no one comes, no one comes away from this project unscathed from either of those two things. Um, engineering standards, design standards, construction standards, procurement, accounting. Um, like I said, IT is involvement, Autodesk, AUD licensing. It's just a whole, whole mess of things. Um, how are we doing? I'm sorry. Let's see. Oh yeah. Backwards compatibility. This is my second time that I get to apologize to Pat, uh, on backwards compatibility. Uh, cause I've been coming to the pug since 2018 and I've never got a chance to, um, present. And so I get the opportunity twice today and apologize twice. So hopefully I'm done after this point. Um, cause it's, it's a lessons learned thing as well. So on the back end side of things, you get in what you put out, uh, training implementation. When you think the configuration's over, it's not, it just continues on. You're always looking for enhancements. we talked about it a little bit, just a little bit ago. There's always rules changing, calculations that change or something uh, gets new or added and someone has to be on top of it. Not only have to be on top of it, but they have to remember all the steps to make it happen. And what happens if you haven't touched it in two years? Everyone sleeps. So you're going to have to deal with some of those things on the back end. And in order to kind of counter that, kind of like the last thing here is documentation, documentation, documentation. Maybe those SharePoints will be able to help you get to where, you're, where you need to be. Uh, and do everything you can to retain your a a AUD admin. And like I said, there's always going to be something that's going to need to be uh, updated. And when you think you have the perfect team, someone leaves or moves on in the company or gets a promotion or does something. So um, uh, let's see. The last thing here. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, just documentation, documentation, documentation. Just make sure you have everything in, in order to, to do that. And I'm going to let Michael kind of carry it out from here uh, to talk about kind of partner support. And, and what that looks like. Yeah, so to, um, I guess, to add to what uh, Wes and many of you have been talking about, um, I have two, two kind of separate points I want to go over, and one's the SPS implementation process, um, and then that ongoing partner support. And then the other one is, a, is more of a conceptual idea, right, for core functionality weighted mindset. Um, and I'll, I'll dive a little deeper into that. Um, here in a minute, but first on the SPS implementation process, when we talk about that, um, one of the standout benefits uh, is that you have the partner's commitment, that's us and there are other partners in the room, um, for that ongoing support past your go live. Um, and unlike other processes where support ends once the solution is implemented as partners, we're here to continue uh, you know, assisting and, and uh, supporting you even after you're fully up and running. Um, that's that's one of the greatest benefits to this process that SPS has built. Um, but what that means, essentially, is that you're not ever going to be alone in this. We're always here to help you. Um, and uh, and that lets you focus on the things that you, you need to focus on. But that also allows you to make sure that you're getting the maximum uh, out of your investment. So that's that's my my soap opera essentially on on you know that implementation process and and we um, we as a partner uh, work seamlessly with the other partners and SBS we we operate as one unit as SBS and I just want to make sure that everyone here understands that um, that's um, that's a pretty mutual feeling across all partners from my understanding and uh, that seamless. Uh, support of a dish of other partners helps to make you all's products better. Um, so that's just something that just me being in technology before, I, I can really appreciate that, that we're not all going at each other's throats, um, and, but that makes a better product for you all. So, so this, uh, this core functionality weighted mindset, um, 
I've heard a lot from several of you, and, and this is something that I've just kind of been mulling over the last couple months, uh, being part of multiple implementation processes. There's a lot that has to get done in a really short time frame. And I may not have worded this perfectly, but I want to at least throw it out there just so that others can start um, start churning the idea um, and get, get um, some more feedback on what others think. But basically this approach is, uh, it emphasizes the importance of focusing just on the core functionality that you need. Um, so by doing that, by doing this, you're going to be able to create a more like comprehensive and robust solution, right? An end-to-end -end solution. Um, and you're starting where it matters first, which is at the base level. If you don't have a base product, um, then it doesn't matter what you add to it. It's never going to work right. So our advice and let's try not to throw anything here, but so our advice is not to sweat the small stuff during initial implementation. Now, I know a lot of people are going to say, well, no, we want every single little piece to work exactly as it always has worked. Um, and in a perfect world, that can happen. Um, and I'm, I'm sure like Pat's probably going to hit me for that. But the, the way I see it is, you know, we should probably prioritize key functions that are going to set up the foundation for future enhancements. Um, and that's going to help reduce stress and um, that kind of comes along with post go live or, uh, you know, stress that people find during SID UAT uh, hypercare um, that's may not necessarily be uh, required. Uh, another advantage to, to focusing on your core product, like just the, the get the base done and then work about work on enhancements later. This approach is also going to minimize risks of defects, um, and post go live, go live headaches. So that gives you more freedom and time to focus on like higher level tasks, like creating a, a, a stable design tool, right? Because at the end of the day, that's what you're doing with this is you're, you're designing, um, while we do understand that there's uh, there are key pieces like the UDHGIS and EAM that need to be built in so that that those design pieces can be, you know, communicated back and forth to other systems. Um, if you if you just take it from a higher level and can do as the the minimum required to make sure that we get that solid and stable first, then it's easier to add enhancements on top. Uh, but I think a lot of you are already seeing that in your implementation, so I just wanted to at least touch on that. Um, don't be discouraged if it's not perfect as soon as you go live, uh, because that's what SBS and the partners are here to help and support you with um, post go live and post hybrid care. Um, I know a lot of you have talked about that and um, any one of the partners, uh, we're all here to help you with that, answer questions. Um, and it's been great being able to talk already and try to help find solutions to things that you all are running into now uh, and hear solutions that some of you have for problems that others have. So. Um, that's, that's really all I had. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. We just kind of wanted to run through that so you guys can get to as building. So, yeah, I guess the last thing that I wanted to say was how do you plan for, uh, uh post support live su or post go post live support is start planning from the beginning, uh, right from, right from the very get go. And, uh, just know that that's, that's going to help set you up for success on the back end. So. And obviously us and other vendors are also here to help you with that, uh, that side of things. And, uh, one of the things that I thought was funny, I was trying to remember that I, I failed to mention that Scott said, uh, is everyone has engineering standards and design standards until you start to implement AUD. Um, it's just, it really helps punch holes through what you think is a, a perfect process and helps kind of create those standards, which is, it's gold. So. It's good stuff. But anyway, thanks for your all time.